Welcome to the Gray Divorce Podcast, hosted by divorce financial analyst and retirement planning counselor, Andrew Hatherley. Join Andrew and guest experts as they help late life divorcees build the financial and mental foundation for a meaningful future. There is life after divorce. Now on to the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Gray Divorce Podcast and Happy New Year. This is our first episode of 2024, and today we're going to be chatting with certified divorce lending professional John Drennan. John and I are going to be focusing on the world of reverse mortgages and how specifically they might be used to help older divorcing couples with their real estate and financial planning needs in divorce and after divorce. John is a sales manager at Fairway Independent Mortgage Corporation in Las Vegas and has over 20 years experience in the mortgage lending industry. He specializes in helping seniors and divorcing couples uh, find the best mortgage options for their specific needs, and he's licensed in 15 states. John, Happy New Year and welcome to the Great Divorce Podcast. All right. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. I've been listening to your podcast for a long time and you guys, you and I have been friends for years. So thank you very much for having me on, not only uh, to this great podcast, but also the first one in 2024. So yeah, hopefully. starting the year off with a bang, John. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. And yeah, we just want to get more information, education out to our uh, listeners. And I just, once again, appreciate the opportunity and I'm glad you and your family had a wonderful and safe holiday season. Great. Well, thank you very much. And and you, like I are, are all about educating uh, our clients on the options available for them, you know, particularly in divorce when people's, um, you know, can be distracted by the, the, the stressful emotional uh, issues involved. And it's always a difficult situation when making a uh, uh, such an important uh, financial decisions. I should probably say at the outset, I, I said it in the introduction, but as a certified divorce lending professional, uh, I always encourage my uh, my clients who I'm working with on the financials of divorce to bring someone such as yourself into the process as early as possible. And, I, and I've spoken to your friend and mine, Jody Bruns, on another podcast about this. It's just that you can offer um, so much help in and to the attorney as well in perhaps avoiding some language in the divorce, which might make it more difficult for um, for financing, um, for real estate financing down the road. Yes, I, I 100% agree. Uh, uh, number one, first and foremost, Jody Bruns is amazing and she is a great friend of ours. Uh, number two, you're correct. At the beginning of the process is easier than at the very end. But even if, even if you say, John, here's what it's looking like and I'm, this is being finalized in 24 hours, I can still give some last minute information. Uh, what happens is, is an attorney is going to write it either by the local laws, the state laws, and just, um, you know, the laws in regards to the agreement that you guys have. And it may be 100% perfectly fine. But if it's not in a mortgage friendly way, as you said, Andrew, um, then all of a sudden, you're going to come out, you think you've got smooth sailing, you bring the final document to myself for any mortgage lender, and we have to deal with what the final um, divorce decree and the final settlement agreement states. And sometimes it's not mortgage friendly. And I literally have had individuals walk into my office, show me their divorce decree and their settlement agreement, and they are going to make a lot of money. Unfortunately, it's over a short time, and then it becomes non-mortgage income. Right. And they think they make $10,000 a month, and I say, you don't make it long enough, and it should be $8,000 for a longer term. Right. You could have bought a house, now you have zero mortgage income. Right. And yeah. you know what? I I tell people it's it's a no brainer to get this sort of education from um, a CDLP divorce lending professional as early in the process as possible, because you can't charge fees during the process. It's against your code of ethics. So um, it's good education and it's free. You know why not? Uh, people just don't know. People just they don't, don't know. know. Yeah, no, I'm so I'm, exactly. They they don't know and 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 my. Um... My marketing gurus that I'm working with, we're really going to be pushing it out this year. Uh, just more education, more YouTube videos, more uh, YouTube shorts, Facebook postings, LinkedIn, just really getting it out there and educating. And I really love what you just said. First and foremost, 
This is not something that you just go online and click a button and pay $59. I mean, it's a, it's a whole certification class. Um, you Then you, you get educated on a monthly and weekly basis and 100% code of ethics. You cannot be charged. So let's throw it out there. There has unfortunately been some bad apples in the world over the many, many years. So if you ever hear of a CDLP saying, hey, I can give you this guidance advice, I can do everything that my certification allows me to do, but there's a charge from one penny to a hundred dollars that is 100% against the code of ethics. And if right. that happens, please let me know. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Let's get to the, uh, the, the thrust of our conversation today and please, please talk to me as you would a sixth grader, because I know enough about reverse mortgages to be dangerous. And as a financial planner who tends to be on the more conservative side, um, you know, I've heard in the past some not so great things about reverse mortgages, but I've become a lot more open-minded um, over the course of the last four or five years to the potential problem-solving um, abilities of, of this product. But why don't we start out at the beginning and, and simply say, what exactly is a reverse mortgage? That's the best question. Let's really talk about that. A reverse mortgage is a mortgage loan. It allows homeowners to borrow money using their home as a security for the loan, but unlike a traditional mortgage where you have an interest rate and you pay principal and interest every month, when you take out a reverse mortgage, you use the equity to absorb the interest that you will not make payments on. So let's break that down. If you have a $100,000 loan, it's going to have an interest rate, it's going to have a term, and it's going to have a payment. That payment typically is principal and interest taxes and insurance. Now, right. if you have a $100,000 reverse mortgage, what will happen is the interest will go up every single month slowly versus going down and you'll still pay your your uh, taxes and your insurance, but you will not ever make a principal and interest payment unless you choose to or your financial advisor gives you advice to possibly do it because you're taking money from other taxable sources and now that could be a tax write-off, but that's going to be some higher-end things that, Andrew, uh, of course, you would be advising your clients on that. Right. So unlike a traditional loan, which is paid off over time, um, but you're making a payment, with the reverse mortgage, you're not making a payment, and the loan builds over time and is ultimately paid off uh, with the, either the sale of the house or potential refinancing down the road. Correct. Correct. You can refinance out of a reverse into a traditional if you choose. Um, during the last four or five years with extreme appreciation, people have reversed, uh, refinanced the reverse into a new reverse to access more equity or from the sale of the home or for the forced sale. When I say forced sale, if you are, if you have passed and you're the last remaining survivor, then your state has an obligation to satisfy that loan, which most people don't just pay it off they typically sell that asset. Okay, so one of the things that I've come across in doing research on uh, on reverse mortgages is that most reverse mortgages happening in the United States right now are, are known as HECMs or home equity conversion mortgages. And these are these are FHA insured, right? Yes, sir. 100%. Okay, so how does the 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 Heckam work then, as opposed to, I think what are called proprietary reverse mortgages, which are, I guess, some of the ones that maybe I'm a little bit more nervous about. Okay, so yes, so proprietary typically means you're just exceeding the Heckam FHA loan limits. Okay, so that's typically, and the loan limits are also tied to the value of your home. So as an example, if the value of your home cannot exceed $1.1 million and you owe zero and you want to get full accessibility because your house is worth $3 million, that would exceed that value. So you could not do a HECM, which is an FHA, um, an FHA backed reverse mortgage. You would be doing a proprietary reverse mortgage. And those typically are in, I'm going to use California as an example, uh, mom and dad, bought a house and now they're the grandparents or the great grandparents and they paid $400,000 for it in 1970. And now all of a sudden that darn thing is worth $5 million and that $5 million owned free and clear. And 
and um, through finan uh, a financial advisor's advice, maybe a CPA's advice, uh, multiple different people, they deem a reverse mortgage makes sense and they want to utilize the true value of their home to make the, the loan go through, they're going to be well above the FHA allowed value, which is going to be a little bit over a million dollars. Uh, of course, it changes every year. It was like 1.0 something and 23 just went to 1.1 and change. Um, so that's that's an example of that. Now, let's go back to your question about FHA. FHA is guaranteed, right? It's backed. It's You pay an insurance premium that guarantees. So proprietaries can make their own rules up. Um, they are not FHA guaranteed back, but they have very, very, they have so many similarities, but I, I'm so glad you brought it up. Don't think that one is the same as the other. Right. So the FHA, you, you often hear the term non-recourse loan. Is that where the, the guarantee comes into effect? Yes. Now, a lot of proprietary ones have levels of that too, but we're really going to focus today on the HECM and the FHA. And right. that non-recourse means that I call it Yahtzee. So if you have a nice, wonderful young couple in their 60s or 70s, and they end up getting a reverse mortgage, and let's say they well outlive it. So let's say over the years, they don't never make a payment. And let's say, sadly, over the years, maybe the value has come down a little bit and they pass away when they're in their 90s. And let's say that the house is worth using round numbers, 500,000, but the balance owed is 600 to keep it simple. That $100,000 is easily wiped away, non-recourse to the estate, non-recourse to the heirs because you had paid into the guaranteed insurance policy. And people say, John, Reverse mortgages are, let's say, more expensive than traditional. Yes, they are, but you're paying into a guaranteed insurance policy that if you, quote, unquote, outlive it, you owe more than what your house is worth. You, your heirs, your estate will never have to pay it back. Yeah, that's a very important fact. And I want to get into, because it's a common misconception people have about uh, about reverse mortgages, is that uh, you know the homeowner will owe more than the value of the home. I want to get into some of those other misconceptions um, in a minute. But I want to skip get back to the basics here, you know, in the, in the issue of what is a reverse mortgage and 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 who is it best suited for? What are the eligibility requirements? Now, a heckam, you've got to be sixty two years of age, right? Great question. Great question. So let's talk about that. So if we have two, if we have an individual person, yes, you must be sixty two or older, and that's going to be for a traditional heckam. If you have two friends that live together and they're 62 and older, they're perfectly fine. They both go on the loan. But let's say that you have a 62-year-old woman who's married to a 55-year-old man. Can you still do a HECM? The answer is yes. But instead of the analytics being associated with a 62-year-old, we will use the youngest person. Okay, that'd be number one. Number two, though, the person who's 55 cannot be on the loan. They're considered a non-purchasing spouse because all individuals on the loan must be 62. Okay? Right. So in that example, you have wife on the loan, husband not on the loan, husband on title, but all the analytics are based upon a 55-year-old, not a 62-year-old, with one exception in the state of Texas, which I am licensed in, all spouses must be 62. Okay. So- Key eligibility requirements then, um, with respect to age 62, it follows to reason then, or stands to reason that age and equity in the home, unlike a traditional mortgage, play a much greater role in how much you can access uh, rather than a, tradi rather than a traditional uh, mortgage, which is uh, focused on uh, income levels and income levels and um and and credit scores and loan to value yeah and the loan to value of course is going to be much higher so yes you're 100% correct because in a traditional world from a person who's 18 years old until the or till 99 we say do they qualify income assets credit and down payment or equity in the house because they can be 99 and still get a 30 year loan because it, as long as they're going to make the payment as long as they live they're they're okay but on a reverse mortgage, you're 100% correct. If we use just once again, kind of like the idea of a, of a life insurance policy, an actuary chart, a, you know, when the estimated person may pass away, 
and you can use a lot of different analytics for this, but let's just use a hundred years old. If somebody is 62 years old and we expect them to live to a hundred years old, that's 38 years of them not making the principal and interest payment. If somebody's 85 years old and they live to hundred years old, that's only 15 years of them not making a principal and interest payment. So you're hundred percent right, Andrew, the younger you are, the more equity you need or the more down payment you need if you're buying it, buying a house with a reverse mortgage. If you're older, less down payment you need or less equity. And then of course, interest rates and margins tied to that will also change daily. And that's something that happens every Tuesday. We get the notice of what the principal limit factors are going to be. And that determines how much equity is needed or how much cash that person can maybe access. Okay, so let's let's look at some of the the main reasons why homeowners would use a reverse mortgage. And uh, I mean, obviously, there's that access to cash, and you mentioned that they're they may be house house rich and and cash poor. That's got to be one of the uh, one of the concerns. Um, you know, what other reasons do you see for people using reverse mortgages? Well, one of the um, reverse 101, uh, how do you put it, in, in regards to educating clients is the three-bucket simulator, okay? And the three-bucket simulator is very simple. Income, assets, house. The assumption is when you're working, your income is going to be higher than you're retired. Now, that's not for everybody, Andrew. Right. I know that you have some wonderful clients that have worked hard for many years, and you're able to create more income in retirement than what they were making. But typically, you would agree, your income goes down in retirement. If your lifestyle stays the same, then and you make less money, you're going to take money from somewhere. And where is somewhere? Assets. Mm -hmm. Now, if you take your money from your assets, that your assets are going to dwindle, or you're going to make less money on your money. Right. The last thing is typically, and this is more historically, now this is going to be a little different, Andrew, because we are coming out of the economic collapse of 06, 07, 08, where a lot of people in their 40s and 50s lost their house. So now that they are in their retirement years, maybe their houses are not free and clear, but a lot of appreciation has happened in the last 15 years. Right. So with that being said, the concept is why take out money and dwindle your assets? Why take out money and not have as much return. Plus a lot of retirement uh, assets, well, such as 401ks could possibly be taxable. So you use the equity in your house, which is tax-free because borrowed money is tax-free. And you also eliminate typically the number one expense that somebody has, which is the principal and interest portion of their mortgage. Certainly there are some financial planning considerations involved. Wouldn't uh, that's probably, uh, a good topic for another uh, for another podcast, but uh, okay. our time is limited. And I want to get into, you know, the uh, kind of the, uh, the the elephant in the room. If that's the right metaphor. Mm -hmm. But you know, some of the common myths or misconceptions about uh, about reverse mortgages, because I know it's it puts a lot of people off. And frankly, until the last few years, um, some of these some of these myths have kind of put me off discussing them but um i've become a little bit more educated about it and i wanted you know the listeners of the podcast to uh to just be aware of uh of some of the uh some of the misconceptions out there so i mean we've mentioned one thing already about the uh um you know the homeowner owing more than the value of the house and, and finding themselves in, in trouble that way and that not being an issue with fha guaranteed heckums um, what are some of the other common misconceptions? Um, the first one is your home will be taken away when you pass away. Right. And or you don't own your home anymore. So let's talk about the second one. When you go buy a car, do you tell your best friend, hey, look, I just bought a brand new Ford F-150? Or do you say, hey, I just financed a Ford Motor Credit F1. You know what I'm saying? You right. own it. You just have to lean against it. <laughs> right. You own your house. You owe the bank. You own your car. You owe the bank. And the time that you finally get the transfer of title or the deed is when you do not owe anybody. The difference is instead of borrowing money at whatever percentage or whatever dollar amount, and instead of that money slowly, and remember on a 30 year loan, typically the first 15 years, are more interest than principal. So instead of slowly having that balance go down, 
that balance will slowly go up because interest will be added onto the balance. If you sell your house and there's equity, you sell it traditionally, get the payoff, and you get the money. If you pass away and there's equity, your heirs will get the payoff, have a realtor list it, and then the money from that sale will then go to your heirs. So you are 100% protected. You own the home. You just have a lien against it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other misconceptions? Well, a lot of people, I hear this term all the time. I don't want a mortgage payment. I rarely hear the term, I want my house free and clear. And I mm -hmm. want my deed of trust. And I want to put it under my pillow. And I want to sleep well at night. So if you say you don't want a payment, you mean a principal and interest payment. Not necessarily your home free and clear. Because if your home is free and clear, you still have four things you must do every single day, every single month, every single year. You got to pay your taxes when they're due. Got to pay your insurance when they're due. If you have an HOA, homeowner association, you got to pay it when it's due. And of course, you got to maintain your house. Right. So you just eliminate the principal and interest. So if I had a scenario where I had $400,000 burning a hole in my pocket and I was 80 years old, I could buy a $400,000 house, cash, or I'm just making up numbers. I could buy a $400,000 house and maybe only put down two seventy-five. dollars Now I still have an extra $125,000 that my good friend Andrew is managing, helping me create income sources. Or if I really wanted to go for the gusto, I could buy maybe like a $550,000, $560,000 house and put down $400,000 and buy the bigger, better house because I still, once again, do not have a payment. I just don't own it free and clear. You know, I think in the in the past, you know, one of the things about a, a house is that it's forced savings. And while it may not always be the best in terms of financial planning to have so much money in the house, one of the issues that I've heard in the past about reverse mortgages is that the size of the cash payouts and maybe some of the people haven't been responsible with some of the cash they've gotten. Um, now, granted, you know, and people have an individual responsibility. Um, but I'm wondering if if the FHA or, or the, the regulators have looked at this issue at all with respect to people getting this, you know, windfall of cash and then perhaps not managing it properly. Because it's great to talk about giving working with your financial advisor and with a conservative portfolio. But unfortunately, there's a lot of people who who may waste the money. 100%. So let's let's kind of dive right into that on a lot of different levels. So let's talk about that. You're talking about this, the person maybe with a three, four hundred thousand dollar house or the grandparent and they own it free and clear and they, they don't want to, nor can they really afford to make payments monthly, but they want to tap into their equity. So the first thing is we do not in the, in the reverse mortgage world, the heckin' world, we do not give people 80 cents on the dollar like a traditional mortgage because these people are not paying it back. Right. So right. we the amount that they can access is significantly less equity wise than what they could if they were going to pay it back. So if you own your house free and clear, you can get 80 cents on the dollar, pay it back. So on 300,000, you can get 240 up front. But on a 300,000, you might only get accessibility of 40, 50, 60,000, maybe more. The second thing is you only get a certain portion and percentage your first year. That's another stopgap. That's another way to protect the client by saying you have your line of credit of making up numbers here, $150,000, but you can only access 78,000 the first year. They have to go 12 months in one day before they can access the rest. And that's another reason. It's kind of like the lottery thing. You win the lottery, you don't tell anybody for six months and get your affairs in line. Same concept. We do not want to have some humongous windfall where an 80 year old man um, has been maybe bamboozled a little bit by a great granddaughter or a grandson and, hey, help me build, start a business and take all their money out. And now, so there's definitely stop gaps there to protect. And then there's, just so you know, there's other ways to actually get your money, not just through withdrawals or through lines of credit. You can actually have monthly payments. Right. Uh, some are called terms. Hey, John, give me $500 a month for the next 10 years. That's a term or tenure. Give me $500 a month for the rest of my life. Sometimes those numbers come together. Sometimes they don't. Everybody's scenario is different. And I typically work with individuals like yourself, Andrew. Hey, Mr. or Mrs. Financial Advisor, 
what does Mr. or Mrs. Smith need? Do they need accessibility to money at any given time? Or do they need actual income sources because they have a shortfall based upon your complete financial analysis? Right. No, that's that's great. Uh, you know, in the limited amount of time we've got left here, I'd like to discuss, you know, this is the Gray Divorce Podcast. So let's let's look at a couple of scenarios where potentially a reverse mortgage might help a divorcing couple uh, in later life. Okay. So um, let's, let's, let's look. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, let's die. Do you want to talk about uh, them selling a house and buying each uh, uh, with reverses or maybe one stay and one leave? What do you think? Let, let's start with the one staying, one leaving, because I tend to see more of that. Exactly. And I'm so glad you brought that up, because just so you know, statistically, in a divorce situation, 75% of the time, if possible, one of the spouses wants to keep the house. Sometimes in the earlier years, in a, you know, somebody in their 30s or 40s, maybe it's specifically to keep the house for the children. Maybe it's specifically to be in that school district, uh, but 75% want to keep the house. So that's extremely important. So, and let's just throw out once again, another scenario. Let's say that we have two individuals, they're 70 years old and they're trying to do their assets. And let's say we're going to pick on the man this time. The man hasn't had a job uh, the man's income was very low. Maybe he was a self-employed individual for many years. And maybe the soon-to-be ex-wife, she has good income sources, pension, and things like that. But he wants to keep the house. Well, maybe he can keep the house, do a reverse mortgage, access the equity that is available in that first year. Maybe it's enough. Maybe it's not. Um, then he can give that to his soon-to-be ex or ex after it's done. So that gives her the opportunity to take that money and maybe other resources to go ahead and buy a house with a reverse mortgage since they're both, let's say, 70 years old or with uh, a traditional mortgage if she chooses that way. But this is a way that a free and clear house for a gentleman who doesn't have the income sources, but he has enough because there are rules and regulations we have to follow. He has good enough income for reverse, but maybe he doesn't make enough to have a $2,500 payment. And maybe there's a way that there's, you know, he says, hey, take, take this $200,000 from this one account and then I'm going to get a reverse mortgage for a remaining X amount of dollars, depending on what it, accessibility is in the first 12 months. All that money together pays her half of the house. He stays in the house with a reverse, no payment, right? Same thing. And then he used his other assets and or the reverse together and gave her the money she needed to go do what she needed to do. Okay. Um, that's a potential solution I could see. What... In the in the slightly more rarer case where the couple are, let's say the judge they go to court and the judge says you got to sell the house, and uh, and so they've got this chunk of equity. Um, how can this work work for a couple? And particularly, you know, if they're they they they're going to miss this house because it's a nice house. Now they may want something a little smaller because you know they're they're they may be downsizing and there's not two of them; it's just one of them. But there's the issue of, you know, what can they get now? You know, maybe their income is lower. The, the, the split of the equity isn't going to allow them to get the kind of house they want. How can the heck them help a couple in this situation emerging from divorce and, and selling the house and, and both of them looking for a new place to live? Well, you know what? That actually happens more than you know. And here's why. The reason is, is let's pick on Summerlin here in Las Vegas, if you've lived in Summerlin and you've lived in your nice little niche community. Let's, uh, let's, let's uh, for our listeners outside of Las Vegas, this is a particularly <laughs> bougie area of, of Las Vegas. I'm sure your town has one too. <laughs> Every town does. Yes. Yes. And I'm going to use that as an example because if you've lived in that area, you're, you know, you literally walk to maybe your closest grocery store, maybe your, um, uh, uh, you know, Mahjong club is right down the street. I mean, you don't want to leave that. And so use examples $800,000 house, sell it. And let's make an imaginary world. There's no fees. Both people get $400,000. Well, maybe that community doesn't have $400,000 houses. So you're right. They leave that 3,000 square foot house. They don't need that anymore because it's just individual. And let's arbitrarily say they buy the same house. Maybe they buy a nice 1,800 square foot house in that surrounding neighborhood, something where they can still partake in all the things that they've spent the last 20 years of their life doing. And guess what? Maybe they buy it for $600,000. They don't need 600,000 cash. They got 400. Maybe those numbers work. And all of a sudden now they were able to buy that house. No principal and interest payment. 
and they're still in the neighborhood, the area that makes them feel safe, comfortable, and something they've known for the, like the last 20, 25 years of their life. It does. It, it, it is intriguing. The, uh, the potential options that are, uh, that uh, that become available with uh, with this strategy. Look, John, we could go on for another half an hour easily um, on um, um, issues around uh, and 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 uh, examples of, of the use of of reverse mortgages for for older people, and particularly older people uh, emerging from divorce. What I would uh, ask you is, uh, you know, John's great. Uh, in that he believes in educating clients um, so that they, they're they they're making the decision that's appropriate for them. Um, he's got lots of great educational materials. John, how can uh, our listeners, if they're uh, intrigued by this or just want to educate themselves a little bit more about, uh, about what we've discussed today, uh, how can they contact you? Well, the e two easiest ways is going to be calling me directly or texting me saying, hey, I heard you on the podcast. I'd like more information. And I do have some free marketing materials that will break different things down. Uh, some will be for homeowners. Some will be for people that are looking to buy. So you can buy a house with a reverse mortgage. So then we send them the appropriate material. Uh, that phone number is 702-612-0802. And remember, even though I'm the home based in Las Vegas, I am licensed in 15 states, all the way as, as far northwest as Oregon and Idaho, all the way down to Florida, up to Michigan and in the Midwest. So, you know, feel free or you can always email me and that's John, J-O-H-N period or dot Drennan, D-R-E-N-N-E-N -N -E -N, at Fairway, M as in Mary, C as in cat dot com. So it's john.drennan at fairwaymc.com. And I will just get your information. We can talk on the phone. Uh, please understand that a traditional mortgage, you talk to somebody one, maybe two times, you know what the rate is, you know what the fee is, you know what your payment is, you rock and roll. A reverse mortgage takes one to six times of short talks, long talks, educational talks. Um, a lot of times it's about family. I bring in, the sons and the daughters. Sometimes I bring in the grandchildren who are going to be the heirs. Um, and when we have a individual who believes in the product and knows the worth and the value, and we bring in the family members so they understand that, like you said, Andrew, yeah. the house is not going to be taken away. Right. We're not going to owe on this house. Grandma and grandpa are going to live their life fully because they have more financial flexibility. That's what this product provides. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's very important. John, thank you very much and all the best for 2024 and beyond. Yes, same to you. And I'm super excited to continue to listen to your podcast weekly. Thanks. Appreciate it. Cheers. All righty. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of the Gray Divorce Podcast. To learn more or get in contact with your host, you can visit Andrew's website at transcendretirement.net. Also, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. That helps others find the show and we greatly appreciate it. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode. Information provided is educational only and should not be construed as legal or tax advice. Each situation is unique and should be discussed with your tax or legal advisor prior to implementation. Andrew Hatherley is not an attorney and does not provide legal advice. Information provided is financial in nature. Advisory services offered through Hatherley Capital Management, LLC. Divorce financial analysis services offered through Wiser Divorce Solutions, an affiliated company.